today, Harry Dent says the bubble still has to burst. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Welcome to the latest post covering finance and problem news with a distinctively Australian flavour. Today I'm joined again by Harry Dent. Hi, Harry. Oh, hi, Martin. Good to be back. Yeah, great to see you uh, on the channel again. Thanks for spending some time with us. And, uh, you know, you're coming down and we'll cover that a bit later in the, in the show. But um, I think the uh, good place to start would be, you know, there's a lot of uh, spooking out there in the media here saying the property market's now back up, you know, everything's fine again. Uh, what's your perspective on what's going on here in Australia with regard to property? Well, I tell you, the way I look at it, Martin, last time, the last global crisis, we led it in the United States and we led the real estate decline, which you guys didn't experience. A lot of other countries did. Our real estate peaked about two years before the economy fell on a recession. It was a leading indicator, and we were a leading indicator of the whole world. I view Australia this time. China's got more control over its market. Otherwise, they'd be first. You guys, to me, are leading the second global bust in real estate. It's going to be more pervasive. It's going to affect more countries. China is going to be the epicenter of that, which has much more impact on Australia than it does the United States. Uh, for real estate, especially foreign buying and your trade with China. So I, I think uh, I am disappointed, but I understand human nature. You guys have been living in a good real estate market as far as anybody knows or can remember. You didn't have the uh, a real estate crash or even a downturn of significance in the, in, the, in the GFC. We did, a lot of other countries did. I understand you think, oh, you know, it can't happen to us. One of the things I tell people when I come there speaking, Martin, I always get this thing, oh, Harry, I, I, oh, you got good demographic, oh, yeah, great stuff, but you don't understand Australian real estate. I'm like, baloney. <laughs> I consider, and I was in California 22 years before I moved to Florida and now Puerto Rico, not that long ago. California and Australia are the two most similar real estate markets in the world to me. They both have very good climates, attractive places to live. They have strong immigration, especially in foreign buying and real estate, um, and very good climate and nice. I mean, Australia is a hip place. I would live there if I couldn't. I mean, I would live there over the United States if I could. California is the coolest place to live in the States, unless you're in financial services in New York. I still think it's cool. So they're very similar. And, and the thing I tell people is, what people don't get about bubbles, and this is the second global real estate bubble and the second bubble for Australia. You just didn't get hit hard last time. The best cities bubble the most and therefore go down the most. People keep telling me, oh, yeah, yeah, but I'm in, I'm in Sydney or Melbourne. I'm in Manhattan. I'm in Lo downtown London. This can't go down. The richest people will always buy here. No, that's where the richest people have been buying. The richest people, the top 1%, has way more leverage and control of assets than they've had for since 1929. And that's where they've gone. And people don't realize the top 1% and 0.1% and even 10% that buy this expensive high-end real estate, they're the ones that lose the most when a financial asset bubble burst. And this is the biggest one I see since 1929. I can't compare this to 2008-9. This is likely bigger. It's comparable more to 29 to 32, except we have this nice emerging world, which you guys are closer to than us, with Asia being the next big thing, uh, that gives some buoyancy. I don't think this will be as bad. An overall downturn is 1929 to 32, but it will be a similar financial asset bubble reset, and it's going to hit stocks, the biggest commodity. It's already crucified commodities, is, is Australia has felt, and it's going to be more, but not as much relatively. And it's going to hit real estate, and it's the the real estate bubble is global, and I know you're very aware of that. Indeed, yeah. Well, you know, the interesting thing, of course, is that the debt is harder than it's ever been around the world, and and indeed in Australia. And yet the uh, Reserve Bank here is basically um, encouraging people to get into the market now to try and support the economy. We've had uh, loosening of lending rules in the last uh, few months, and we've had a little bit of an uptick in the market, although in fact 
the headline news is um, rather different from the reality, which is that there is some movement at the top end of the market, but not across the total market. Yeah. So uh, that, that's conveniently forgotten by, by the media. But there's, a, there's, a, there's this intent, I think, to try and push property prices higher as part of an attempt to try and support the economy. But, you know, it's a little bit like just how long that can that go on? Because essentially the other critical indicators in the economy here are already looking pretty weak. You know, and they're looking weak every I, Mark, I keep like, every time I give a lecture now, and we just had our conference, our annual conference, I'm like, what can't people get about since 2008? And that is something I predicted 20 years before it happened, when demographics would start to weaken in most developed countries, less so in Australia, but still to some degree, because of the baby boom maturing in their spending, what can people get that no matter how much money they print and how much money they throw in the financial markets and how much the stock market bubbles, the real estate bubble, no matter what we do, the economy keeps weakening. We just had corporate tax cuts, which you guys didn't get from Donald Air Trump, I call him. And that gave a boost for one year. And guess what? We're already back to 2% real GDP, the same old thing we've had since 2008 on average, and the forecast for it to go lower. Everywhere in the world, the forecasts are lower. Australia is slowing more this time. I mean, that's that's a sign. So so this is you can't live off stimulus and free money and debt forever. Debt weighs too much at some point. I mean, you know, you and I understand debt bubbles. Lacey Hunt, who's the only Ph.D. economist in this country, I let speak at my conference because he understands debt bubbles um, and. Most economists just think, well, yeah, the little debt's too high, but they don't understand deleveraging a debt. When you get too much debt, you have excess capacity, it bids up financial assets, everything. You get bubbles that make the cost of living and business more and more expensive, and you have to reset them. It's called deleveraging. It's like a, a drug addict going through detox. It's painful, but it works. 29 to 32 was the, simply the biggest detox of financial debt and financial asset bubbles in US and world history, and we came roaring out of it. The reason Japan never came roaring out of this, and most countries aren't except for Iceland, because we didn't go, we didn't take the medicine. We didn't deleverage the debt. You gotta get unproductive debt out of the way. And by the way, Dr. Lacey Hunt here has the best indicator ever. It's a known indicator, it's just he knows how to explain it. Money velocity. Money velocity isn't just, okay, money's going up or down. It, the rate of money and, and velocity in the stages and tells you how productively a country is investing their assets, everything, infrastructures, real estate, business, everything. And Australia's money velocity, to my surprise, because you have less overall debt than us weighing on the economy, you have much stronger demographics from strong, continuous Asian immigration. Your money velocity is well below the U.S., and we're way above Europe. And super above J Japan and China, the worst, because you guys are so busy speculating in real estate in Australia that nobody's producing anything. That's what happens. Money velocity grows as long as you're productively investing, and, and then that money, then that investment creates jobs and profits that can be reinvested, and that, that's what causes money velocity to go up in a positive path. It starts to slow, and it's still growing, but it starts to slow when people start to get into a speculative phase, like the late 90s, the stock bubble, and then the real estate bubble to follow that. When you get into speculation, money's got, what, what good does it do to keep flipping houses in Australia or to people to fix up their houses and make them, does that do anything for your world competitive stance? Oh, guess what? It makes it worse. A lot of wage gains have to go just to cover the high cost of housing in Australia, especially Sydney and Melbourne. So high, I don't know why people think that high real estate, up to a point, it shows you're a good place, okay? I mean, New York will always be more than Florida and California will always be more than New York just because of quality of life and job opportunity, but up to a point. But when they get overly expensive, you can't afford to do business there and people start to leave and then it's a bad thing. So, so people only fear real estate going down because so many people in Australia and the US, but much more in Australia and Canada now, you guys are much more invested in net worth uh, as a country uh, so I think it's 67% in Australia. It's like 60% in Canada. It's only 30% in the U.S. China, 75% of consumer net worth is in real estate. And, and the only more overvalued country than Australia is China. 
and China is your best customer. They're our biggest competitor. I, I tell you, China goes down, yeah, it's going to hurt everybody in the world, but it's going to help us, and boy, it's going to be the best thing ever happened to India because they're competitors. They're your best customer. You don't want China going out. So I say Australia, yeah, you slipped through the last one. Good demographics, your government debt especially, much lower. So easier to deal with that. But this time, your banks are exposed from what I read, 75% of their loans to real estate. And, and, and China is your biggest customer. And they're not going to sink your GDP, your exports. They're going to sink the entire Asian region. We're not going to feel China's fall anywhere near what you guys are going to feel over there. Yeah, well, I think that's exactly right. So, you yeah. know, because we are tra so trade exposed to China. But one of the interesting arguments that people have here locally is, look, I understand debt's really high, but because interest rates are so low, debt serviceability has not, you know, fly not flying out the window, despite the fact that more than 30% of households are in stress, according to my data. So what about the, the serviceability question, Harry? How does that play into this conversation? Okay, there's a natural trend in that. I've been predicting since I got in the prediction business in the late 80s, that even with the greatest boom in history from baby boom spending and internet productivity and all this great stuff, all my cycles, I mean, it couldn't be better. This, I said from the beginning, this is not going to just be a boom. It's going to be the greatest boom in modern history for most of the world, including the merging world coming along. So, so that's happening. But I say, but inflation is going to keep going down towards zero. High productivity from baby boomers aging. People in their 40s are much more productive than young people entering the workforce in, in their early 20s or late teens. Um, new technologies like this internet that links everybody, Eskimos, everybody. I mean, that's productive stuff. That brings inflation down. So that's natural. But what I've calculated here in the United States, and it's certainly true more so in the rest of the world because our interest rates are higher, our bond rates are about two percentage points for long term for a 10 year treasury bond or a 30 year, two percentage points lower than they would be because of quantitative easing. Governments taking money out of thin air, buying their own bonds. So, yes, governments are issuing record debt. So how do they service it? Well, they buy their own debt with money out of nowhere to push down the interest rates to service it and to push down, push make the bonds easier to float. And that's that's not as big a challenge for Australia as is for US or Europe or Japan, but, but this is fake stuff, so that's not real. So even if interest rates were more normalized and were two basis points, 200 basis points, two percentage points higher, that alone would raise servicing costs substantially. I tell you, Japan would be bankrupt in a minute if that happened. Australia would feel it, we would feel it. So that's fake and at some point, we had a 40-year, I got this chart, this is just crystal clear, 1980, highest inflation rate in history. Guess what? That was caused not by the Federal Reserve and central banks. They weren't printing money back then, just running deficits, because baby boomers were entering the economy at the fastest rate of a new generation history, pushing up costs. They're all costs and no productivity. That's what caused the highest inflation. So, Inflation peaked in 1980. Bonds peaked rates because they had to see it was true. 1981. We had a 40-year bond bull market as rates just went down from, say, 16% on the 30-year Treasury bond or 10-year down to now 2% or less. And they're going to go lower. So that's a 40-year bull market. That's not going to continue. They're going to go the other way. When we come out of this reset, um, we will never see inflation like we saw in the 70s because we won't have this giant baby boom. And even the emerging countries are growing less fast with new people entering and births. Everybody's having less births, just not as fast as the developed countries. And so inflation will come back and say maybe it'll be 2% long term. And then you add a risk free rate of at least 2% of that. You got four and then you got mortgage loans at five or 6% instead of two, three. That makes a big difference. So this servicing thing is not going to last. And what it does is induces people to get more in debt and then things turn around down the road. But it, uh, the other thing, Martin, was just simple supply and demand. When interest rates are artificially low, everybody overinvests. Consumers spend more on houses and cars and fixed assets. Businesses build more capacity and excess capacity pushes down profits. Yeah, indeed. Well, you know, <laughs> what goes around comes around, Harry. Um, one of the questions then is, is, you know, 
the Fed has now started doing repos, right? So effectively manipulating rates at the short term rather than actually out along the yield curve in terms of classic QE. Now, um, you know, Jerome Powell said the other day, no, 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 we're not doing QE, but it looks like QE to me. It does me too. Now, the difference is just what you said. They're buying more short-term T-bills and stuff. They're injecting money in. What happened there, long story short, is the Fed in the U.S., not in Australia, not in China, not in Europe, not in Japan, was draining reserves, you know, selling uh, uh, off their bonds. Instead of QE, instead of buying their selling, they were uh, reducing their monetary base. Well, what happens is the liquidity goes up more than that. So, so I think the money base came down about 15, 20 percent. Liquidity came down 30 to 40 percent. So banks all of a sudden, normally what they do overnight, Mark, you know, they, they borrow from each other, especially the smaller banks from the bigger ones who have tons of reserves. And, then, and, and they can make as much doing that as sitting at the Fed or maybe a little more. So they said, but all of a sudden, you know, they need reserves, too. So the reserves went down twice as fast as the monetary base, and that put pressure on. So now the Federal Reserve is having to put money back in, even though they're buying short-term stuff. I agree with you. Injecting money into the financial system, and that's what creates financial asset bubbles. All the gold bugs, all the conservatives were expecting, oh, this money printing is going to cause consumer inflation. No, it went into asset inflation because they put the money in the banking system. If they'd have sent it to Homer Simpson, which I'd have rather do. I don't like any of this, but I'd rather send it to Homer Simpson than Morgan Stanley. Um, it would have caused more consumer inflation. It's not going in the money supply. Finan if financial assets, stocks and real estate and all this stuff were counted as financial assets, we would have monetary inflation. They just don't count it as that, so it's not showing up. We have massive inflation financial assets. And uh, uh, David Stockman at our conference said something I like. He said, recessions used to be called, I mean, stock crashes used to be caused by recessions. Now a stock crash with so much financial assets overvalued and so much money created by that, a stock crash alone would cause a recession overnight of like 30% or more. So it's the financial bubbles that people should be looking at, not the inflation rate. And even GDP growth, people should just be saying, well, wait a minute. If we're growing, say, at 2% in the U.S., as an example, and we're growing faster than Europe and Japan, but it's 2%. If we had not put $4 trillion into the financial markets and tax cuts of a trillion and a half over 10 years, you know, all this free money, what would our growth rate be? It would obviously be negative. We would be in a depression. 2008 was the beginning of a depression. They just blew their way out of it with financial assets and money printing. And that's yeah. why it's not causing inflation. It didn't go to consumers and the economy. It went to financial assets. And so everybody should be worrying, when does this financial asset bubble burst? And that includes real estate, damn it. Real estate is the biggest financial asset bubble for most households, especially Australians and New Zealand. You guys have way more of your net worth in real estate. So you should be worried about your own real estate going up. Wake up. If you don't, you're going to be get an unpleasant surprise in the next few years, I say. Yeah, Harry, very interesting. And of course, uh, you know, your sense is I think that Australian probably is overvalued. Um, you know, I'm saying 40 percent. What are you saying? Yeah, my my uh, my best indicator. And I got this. I, I had to scratch my head, Martin, for years because I called the, the Japanese uh, bubble burst because it was a bubble much bigger than the U.S. or Australian bubble today in real estate. And their demographics peaked ahead of the rest of the world. So I saw that coming. But what shocked me was when the millennials and they, they don't have as big a millennial generation as the U.S. And you guys have a bigger one than anybody. You got that. That's your your saving grace. When the millennials did come along, it didn't raise real estate prices at all. They fell 60, 70 percent residential, 80 percent commercial and never bounced. I'm like, how could this happen? You know, I finally figured out, Martin, old people dying. The baby boom was such a big force. And especially in all developed countries, adult diapers were outselling baby diapers in Japan. Well, I knew that generally, but it just kicked it off me. Oh, old people, old people growing faster than young people coming along, dyers in real estate faster than buyers. The dyers are, say, 80-ish, 
and the buyers are 42 in most countries. So that's what's happening. Net demand is going down in the United States. It's already peaked. We'll never see higher for decades. Australia has already peaked in 2014. Even though your demographics are much stronger for future booms because of Asians and millennials and stuff, your net demand because of the dying of baby boomers has already peaked. It will go down, continue down into 2021 or two, go back up to this level, 2025 or six, and then slow for decades into 2043. Now, big difference in Australia. Japan's been negative net demand since 98, and they got 8 million empty homes heading towards 15 million. U.S. goes slower and slower, but only goes negative from 2033 to 39, way up. Australia never even gets close to negative. But your net demand pushing on supply is going to be weaker and weaker, and it never gets better than it is just a few years ago. So uh, you're at the top of, of that indicator, and that indicator is what I use in the U.S. That indicator says the U.S., even though the present real estate bubble is only a little higher in dollar terms, it, it relative to GDP, it's a little lower, but a little bit higher. That's not the point. Net demand is lower than it was in 2006 when it peaked last time in Australia. So we're 42 percent overvalued this time versus 21 last time. We went down 34 percent last time. So I'm saying about 50 in the U.S. Australia, I come to the same number you do with this indicator, 40 percent, 42 percent overvalued in Australia, which tells me the downturn is going to be more like 50 percent. So, again, the difference is. I would buy real estate when it's down in Australia because you have better demographics in the future. But still, I think real estate prices in Sydney will not, in Melbourne, will not likely get higher adjusted for inflation than they are at the peak in 2017. I don't think you'll see that. It's just they go down 50 percent. You may recoup a lot of that. And that's way better than the U U.S. will never in Japan, not a hope in all of eternity of ever getting back to their 1991 peak in real estate prices. So this net demand is a big deal. And it's just funny that you and I come to the same conclusion doing strong analysis. Anybody that runs the numbers on this would say it's overvalued. And when you look at price to income around the world, also crystal clear, Hong Kong, by far the most overvalued city. Coastal China, the most overvalued real estate in the world. Australia's next, then Vancouver, then California, then London. These are the places, English speaking countries with high foreign buying, with, you know, that's where real estate's the most overvalued, even more than Singapore. Singapore is very expensive, but the incomes are higher. It's still overvalued. But the, Australia is the second most overvalued in the world. If you're not worried about that, Something's wrong. It's not something wrong with you. You're just not looking at the numbers like you and I are. This is obvious to anybody running simple math. It does not take Einstein to figure this out. It just takes the guts to look at it and then to tell people something they don't want to hear, which is your great Australian real estate bubble is going to burst. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's 30 or 40 percent. Would I want to sit through a two million dollar home? I did this in Miami. I I predicted the bubble in late 2005 was going to burst. It peaked a few months later, early 2006. I sold my house in Miami because I was moving to Tampa, and I talked my wife into renting because we were moving there for her relatives, you know, to take care of us. So, let, you know, that's what I'm going to ask for. If we move to Tampa for your family, I want to rent because I know I'm not going to convince her to even buy. The house we rent, $2 million house, 5000 U.S. dollars. That'd be like 7000 Australian dollars. 6,400 square feet, giant house. The rent should have been 10,000. They were just covering their property taxes and, and mortgage from years and years ago. The house went while we were in it for three years from $2 million to $1 million. We saved a million dollar loss and our rent was half what our carrying cost of that real estate would have been. We got the bargain of our life and we got a property manager. So my wife was very happy I tricked her into that. <laughs> That's yeah, just reality. This is yeah. what happens. And I was in on a golf course in a great house in a great city in Florida and growth. Yeah, that's what bubbles. I don't worry about a bubble if I'm in Omaha down the street from Warren Buffett because nobody wants to live there. And, you know, I don't worry about a, a, as big a bubble in Adelaide as I do in Sydney and Melbourne. Why? Because the most attractive places go down. And I still worry about Perth and, and, and Queensland and stuff because they're more exposed to the commodity crash, which is going to get worse with the fall of China. So... That's, you know, 
I just tell people, I know this doesn't make sense. I know you've only seen real estate go up your whole life. Well, so did we in America until 2008, eight nine when we got hit. And just a 34% crash. We had foreclosures all over the place. The banking system almost totally melted down. Do not take this lightly. Maybe we're over forecasting this. That's possible. But I tell you, there is not much upside in real estate anywhere in the world left after a bubble this size. And, and the smart money does not think like most people. Most people think the longer something goes up, the more I can bank on it. Smart money says, who understands cycle says, the longer something goes up, the closer we are to the next downturn. And the more it's going down, up, more it's gonna go down. I always say the greater the bubble, the greater the burst. This is the greatest bubble in real estate in modern history. And Australia is number two only to China in the extent of this bubble. So there's no way real estate's gonna go up much farther, even if you don't have a crash. And it's extremely likely you're gonna have a substantial reset, a one-time reset, then you can buy. So, you know, maybe you don't wanna sell your main house, fine. I did when I moved from my, uh, Miami to Tampa. Uh, I am renting in Puerto Rico, but I own my vacation property because it's a unique property. It's going from 25 to five acre zoning. So I would lose by selling that one. But, but you know, if you got extra houses you're speculating on, you got a vacation home you don't use that much, or if you're an aging couple and your kids have left the nest and you got a four bedroom house and you want to downsize somewhere down the road to two, do it now. Reduce your exposure to real estate. Real estate is the number one problem in Australia. The fall of China is the number two, and that also affects your real estate because it's such heavy foreign buying. Ne neither of these is the number one problem in the U.S. They're problems, but, but they're, they're your two number one problems right there. So wake up, run some numbers. And I can't, I can't like I say, uh, who, who, who do I recommend people listen to in Australia? You. That's about all I got. You and John Adams. That's, that's it. I, I, Lacey Hunt's the only economist out of anybody I could choose that I have to speak in my conference. He's the only one that understands debt bubbles, financial asset bubbles, and how they must deleverage if the economy is going to stay healthy. It's a good thing in the end. And nobody can keep a bubble going forever. And, and I don't know if you've ever, in my talks, you know, I, I throw out, I compare every bubble in history, real estate and stocks, to the male orgasm model from Masters and Johnson. It's a perfect fit. And you know what happens to orgasm? They die a, a, a quick death. And there is no soft landing for an orgasm. And there's no soft landing for a bubble in this nature. Once it starts to unravel, the leverage and deleveraging just, I mean, that's why they had to print so much. But they had to print. Now, collectively, Stockman and I calculate over here, six all central banks, not just the big six, $16 trillion dollars increase in money injected into the global economy since 2009 16 trillion dollars that's what it took to offset the deleveraging of that bubble and therefore we have more debt than ever as you know and understand and see and more leverage and a bigger financial bubble this stock market's much more bubbly than it was uh back you know before in 2000 much more and people are saying it's not a bubble i'm like what what <laughs> What about a bubble's not obvious? Quacks like a bubble, walks like a bubble, whatever. It's a bubble, damn it. And I just, I'm just, history's gonna look at what were people smoking here, especially the most educated economists, PhDs, and people like Warren Buffett don't see this bubble. What? They're blind. People are high. But, you know, drug addicts don't think they have a problem because they're high. And when they come down, they take more. Well, that's what we're doing in the economy. We're just, it's taking more and more debt to get less and less GDP, diminishing returns. We're getting towards that zero point. And that's when the thing just blows, point it blows up. When it does, the central banks have already blown their ammunition and people have already bought and rebought and refinanced. And how many more times can people refinance their homes, okay? You can't at some point. And then the bubble blows and then everything goes to hell and people go, how could we be so stupid? Well, you could have not been stupid by just waking up and looking at a chart and saying, oh, this looks like an orgasm. This looks like every bubble in history. It looks like a bubble, quacks like a bubble. It's a bubble. These are not hard to recognize at all. And like you say, you do the math on debt and debt ratios and affordability and that service. You know, it's just nothing could be more obvious. People are too high to notice. 
everybody's benefiting. You're watching your 75 inch high definition TV that used to be 10,000, now it's 1,000. Your, you know, you know, your house, you know, your mortgage rates are three, four percent. So they used to be six, seven, eight. You know, you got bigger home. Everybody's benefiting from this artificial high. And that impairs judgment. High people don't make good judgments, whether they're alcoholics, crack addicts, doesn't matter what you're high on. Coffee and cigarettes seem to be the better, because, you know, but people don't have good judgment. Nobody has good judgment. Not the not not the best politicians, not the best economists, not the best global corporate leaders or bankers. Nobody sees this thing because they don't want to. That's not a good reason. Indeed. Yeah. Well, I agree, Harry. And, you know, you and I are preaching from the same page here in terms of the, the issues. Now, you're coming down to Australia uh, in, in a few weeks. Um, so what's your plan? OK, yeah. Yeah. We're doing four, a two day seminar in four cities, uh, 17th and 18th in Melbourne, 19th and 20th uh, in Sydney, 21st, 22nd in Brisbane and then 24th and 25th because it takes a day to get out to Perth. So, you know, I'm going to be giving probably at least four presentations over two days. We're going to bring in the best investment experts because, you know, you got to do something about this rather than just, you know, bury cash in your backyard, which actually wouldn't be the worst strategy. But there are better things to do. So, you know, it, it's I, I'm just telling people I know I, I bet the the attendance will be a little less than our last tour in, in April of this year because real estate was going down. But do, my message to Australians, do not buy this stuff. You are the leader of this downturn. You are cracking first and you deserve to because you're the most overvalued in a more free market economy. And so don't take this, oh, we had a little crash and it's over, a time to buy again because we don't want to miss out. No, you're not missing on anything. Real estate will, mark my words on this, out 5, 10, 15, real estate will never be better than it is right now. So if you don't love it, 200%, put lipstick on that pig and sell it. That's my advice. <laughs> Well, um, Harry, thanks very much for your time. Um, I'm, you know, I'll put uh, the links uh, to your trip ahead and uh, make sure that people are aware of it because I think this is a really, really important message, and particularly now because, of course, all the spookers are out here in Australia claiming that uh, you know property prices are going through the roof again and now's the time to buy, and the government and the Reserve Bank and all the regulators are all trying to do everything they can to save the bubble. The same thing China's doing. Keep the bubble going at all expenses. This is insanity doing the same thing over and over again expecting a different result we will end up at 2008-9 the gfc again the difference is we got more debt i think 60 70 trillion more in the world bigger bubbles in every almost everything we will only have a bigger downturn because we kick the can down the road so if stocks were down 54 they'll be down 70 to 80 real estate in the u.s was down 34 it's going to be down 45 to 50 and again I i'm right with you 40 percent minimum 50 percent in australia and of course the best city is going to go down more and then adelaide and some other cities are, will go down a little less so so if you're in the best cities you should worry more and rich people are the dumbest right now they think they live in the best cities and rich people like them will always buy this overvalued stuff no they won't rich people lose the most money in a financial asset bubble, not a downturn like the 70s was inflationary, recessionary, in a financial asset bubble burst like 1929 to 32 on an exact 90 year cycle to my most powerful long term cycle, the rich people lose the most money. So the highest in real estate will see the biggest vanishing of buyers. And guess what the Chinese will do? The same thing the Japanese did in the early 90s when their domestic real estate started to collapse and they were speculating around the world, what did they pull in first? Their global investments. That's what they pull in first. Chinese are gonna van, they're already vanishing from the US market right now. They're gonna vanish totally. So Australia gets hit relatively by that more than the US or any other country I know of. If I was the Chinese, my first choice would be to buy in Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane. That's where I would buy attractive place in my part of the world and that's what they're doing yeah so i look forward to seeing people and and again we're going i always feature your research i don't have anybody else that knows what they're doing in australia not one single person especially on this real estate thing not one i i feature you share with me i feature your research as well 
because you're much more expert on Australia than I am. And you have a whole level of analysis that, that I don't have. So, so that's really important, too. People are going to get the whole shebang here. Yeah, well, we'll certainly share the up-to-date data. And, uh, you know, the story continues because stress is bigger, um, the debt bubble is bigger, and, uh, and yet people are still trying to convince everybody that uh, suddenly we're out of trouble. Now, I think we're actually in deeper water, and I'm afraid the outlook, to my mind, is uh, as, as negative as neg as always was. I'll give you two, two hints to the audience. The stock bubble's not over till you see that first crash, 40 percent or higher in the first two to three months we have not seen that yet i think we're getting i think that's going to happen next year early mid next year also you are not out of a bubble until you actually see debt deleverage and financial assets assets come down to ordinary values we have only seen bigger bubbles as you say so there, anybody thinks we got to this bubble and 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 we deleveraged we have not deleveraged we have more debt than ever i mean come on how hard is this to figure out <laughs> well, it seems pretty obvious to me and to you, Harry. It's just that so many people can't see it. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time today. Really appreciate it. And uh, um, I'm sure that you'll have a great time here in Australia. I'm sure there'll be a lot of people who will want to, to listen to you in more detail and hear more about your cycles. And we didn't get to sunspots, but one day we will, because I think that's another interesting conversation to have at some point. <laughs> It's the best indicator. I, well, I'd say that in my this technology and 90 year cycle, but it's the best indicator I've added since the original spending wave. And I get the most flack about it. I'm like, if you don't like this, good luck. If you don't think 20 percent more radiation at the top of a cycle affects your energy and, and positivity and affects agriculture and industry. And of course, history proves it does. People just won't look at something. I look at something, no matter what it is, as long as there's, I can show that there's a correlation there's a re and there's a reason for it. I don't have any problem thinking that 20% fluctuations in the radiation we receive from the biggest thing in our solar system would make some difference here on Earth. It does. And it, it's best for calling booms and busts. And that cycle continues to point to its lowest point in the next few years. So this is when... We're going to have this deleveraging. That's one cycle that says this is when it's going to happen <laughs> next few years. Fascinating, Harry. Thank you very much for your time today. Really okay. appreciate it. Thank you, Martin. Cheers. So there you have it. Very important messages from Harry Dent. He and I see things rather similarly with regard to the issues regarding debt bubbles and housing bubbles. But, of course, the broader markets just don't want to listen. I'm Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics. Many thanks for watching, and I'll see you again next time.